it's been a real pleasure to be part of this um, project in a small way. It's very exciting to be working with so many dedicated people who are working not only on the science of invasive species, but also on the policy implementation. I'm going to share with you this morning um, a bit about our experience uh, in New Zealand and also um, at Landcare in working with um, alien invasive species. Then Adam will start talking a bit about uh, the Pacific experience and how that relates to uh, the Caribbean and some of the, the key lessons that we learned from our discussions yesterday. So as Arne mentioned earlier, um, alien invasive species have a global impact of at least 1.4 trillion US dollars. And we can compare that to the estimated impact of climate change, which is also 1.4 trillion dollars. And yet we hear about one of these issues in the news every single day. And we hear about the other issue only occasionally, and only when people in this room make enough noise about it. In the US, it's estimated to be at least 120 billion US dollars per year. In New Zealand, estimates are at least $3 billion per year, which is 2.3% of our GDP. And in the Caribbean, we don't know. Um, if somebody was to hold a gun to my head and, and make me guess, I would say we're talking about at least a billion dollars and probably more in annual costs associated with invasive alien species. Now, New Zealand is a really interesting place to study alien invasive species, uh, in part because of its tremendous remoteness. Uh, there it is in the middle of the Pacific, quite far south, but we, we think of it as this map shows in, as being quite the middle of the world. Um, New Zealand uh, separated from Australia and Gondwana about 80 million years ago, and it evolved, um, mammals evolved during that time such that there were only three species of, of mammals on New Zealand, three land species, um, and all of them were bats, okay? So there were no rats, no mice, no cats, no ungulates, no predators of any kind. And that allowed for a very unique uh, wildlife to develop, including um, birds that would have evolved to fill the, all of those niches and all of those roles that, that mammals would have um, uh, undertaken in other places. So as a result, we have some um, very unique species. This, uh, this pictured here is called a giant weta. It's the heaviest insect in the world. Uh, and as you can see, it fills your whole hand and it eats carrots. Um, New Zealand has the highest rate of endemism in the world. 80% of vascular plants are endemic. 70% of native terrestrial and uh, freshwater bird and, and uh, Freshwater birds, yes. All bats, all native amphibians, all reptiles, and 90% of our freshwater fish are endemic. Because of the unique uh, evolutionary history of New Zealand, um, a lot of these species are very, um, are very special, but a lot of them are also extremely rare. This is the New Zealand fairy tern. There are 35 of them. This is the kakapo. This is a very interesting species. It is a nocturnal parrot that is also flightless. Um, Maori told, used to tell stories, the indigenous, uh, the people that arrived in New Zealand 800 years ago, so our indigenous people, um, tell stories about hunting kakapo, where in order to, to catch a nocturnal flightless parrot, you walk up to a tree and you shake it and they fall out. Um, there's 125 of them. This is the black stilt. This is the rarest wader in the world with about 150 left. This is a bride's whale with only 160 left. This is a very um, interesting um, case in New Zealand history. This is uh, the Chatham Island black robin. They did a census in 1980 and found that there were five birds. One of them was female. Through very careful management, um, there's now about 250 of them. Uh, and it's not only the bird life and, uh, and whales that are, are rare in New Zealand. Um, this is a, a um, species of plant found in the Three King Islands. The known population of this plant is one. 
So New Zealand is known um, for its biodiversity, certainly. It's also known for being uh, a very big primary industry uh, farming country. 39% of the country is covered in grasslands. There's an awful lot of pasture in the country. 25% is native bush, 19% tussock and scrub. You can read the other statistics. Only 1% of the country is industrialized. So there's a lot of open space in New Zealand. And as a result of this, primary industry provides 15% of our GDP and 50% of our exports. Tourism is also uh, extremely important to New Zealand, and this is, uh, obviously has close parallels to uh, the Pacific. Um, this is uh, filming of the Chronicles of Narnia. If any of you have seen those films, they were, they were made in, uh, in New Zealand, but that's not our most successful film. Our most successful film was, of course, The Lord of the Rings. Um, now, there was a survey done in 2004, and they found that 6% of international visitors came specifically because of the Lord of the Rings. And 1% one, one of them said that they only came because of the Lord of the Rings. And that 1% spent $32.8 million. So tourism is very important to, to the economy. Um, the Hobbit was also filmed in Lord of the Rings. And I just bring this photo up um, because those of you with a keen eye will notice that all those pines in the background that they're walking by are um, invasive alien species. New Zealand has a marketing campaign called 100% Pure. And they show images like this. Um, we have a clean green image um, because tourism contributes about $24 uh, billion dollars, um, to our GDP. It's about 6% of our workforce that is engaged in tourism. People come for hiking and adventure sports. Uh, bungee jumping was invented in New Zealand and lots of other crazy things. Um, Sightseeing and bird watching is, is very important to the economy as well. So for all of these reasons and many more, IAS, invasive alien species, are a major threat to New Zealand. I'm going to articulate some of the costs um, that, that we know of. There are 25,000 exotic plants in New Zealand. 2,500 of which have become naturalized, and 300 are considered uh, serious pests and threats to conservation. Weeds in pasture in, uh, for, for dairy farms and, and, uh, and sheep farms cost the economy $1.2 billion per year in lost animal production and control costs. And weeds, in addition to that, pose a threat to one-third of, uh, of nationally threatened plant species. In addition, they could degrade up to 7% of the conservation estate, our national parks, in the next decade. We also have a problem with invasive invertebrates. The direct economic cost of vertebrate pests to the primary sector is estimated to be between $1 billion and $3 billion per year. In 2005, there was a study about a, a single species of sea squirt, and it was found that the costs of that sea squirt were estimated at about $15 million. So even a single species can have a huge impact. Vertebrate, press, vertebrate pests are also a real problem in New Zealand. 32 mammal species and 35 uh, bird species have been introduced and established. And the first um, first mammals came with Maori settlers um, 800 or so years ago in New Zealand, and those were uh, the Kiori or Pacific rat. When Europeans came, they brought other types of rats, dogs, cats, stoats, weasels, ungulates, possums. And as a result of that, the vertebrate fauna in New Zealand has been nearly halved in the last 800 years. Extinctions include one of the three bat species, three frogs, three lizards, one freshwater fish, four plant species, and at least 51 bird species. Uh, this is a, a photograph of a Pacific rat eating a, an, an endemic bird. 
There have been three bird extinctions since the 1960s alone, and uncounted losses to um, invertebrates. New Zealand, as a result of all of this, is also very much at the forefront in thinking about ways to control and prevent and eradicate invasive species. And I want to tell you about some of our, uh, uh, some of our measures and some of our success stories. The country spends half a billion dollars annually on biosecurity. Two-thirds of this is response, but 13% is prevention, 11% surveillance. So there's real dedication to preventing um, invasive species. Um, for example, when you land in, uh, in uh, Auckland International Airport, you first go through immigration, and then you go through customs, and then you go through biosecurity screening. So they take it very seriously. If you bring in camping gear, they take it away from you and wash it, and then return it to you. So New Zealand's experience on border controls and quarantine systems are considered to a, a form of payment insurance, a, a, a form of insurance uh, against catastrophic events. This year, uh, we face a, a 1 in 15 year beach mass. This is uh, when the uh, beech trees seed, and uh, hundreds of millions of seeds will fall onto the forest floor. And when the seeds come, so do the rats and the stoats. And they're estimating an increase of, in rats this year in, of being 30 million rats and uh, tens of thousands of stoats. Uh, and this could, of course, potentially anni annihilate um, endangered bird populations. And so this year alone, our Department of Conservation is spending $21 million just on this program. So real dedication. There are public um, awareness campaigns to try to prevent the spread of aquatic reeds. We have a problem with a, a weed called Didymo. Um, so there's a, a public awareness campaign called Check, Clean, and Dry for anybody that goes into, uh, into uh, water of any kind. Um, there's also a complete ban on using uh, felt booty waders for people that are interested in fly fishing. So some kind of innova innovative prevention measures in place. Perhaps the most innovative thing, at least in, in terms of protecting our uh, bird life, is that uh, New Zealand has embarked in a campaign of, of um, making some islands predator-free. So when you have native uh, bird species, terrestrial bird species, that only are known by 35 or 100 or 200 examples, and you have the threat of invasion of mustelids and rats, the only way to protect those species is to eradicate pests from offshore islands. Um, this has been done in islands as large as Campbell Island, which has 11,000 hectares. And this uh, was, was um, credited with, with uh, saving the rarest duck in the world, the Campbell Island teal. This has been so successful in New Zealand that they've actually started a campaign to create inland island preserves where they put predator-proof fences around native forest to keep uh, predators from coming in. This is, a, this is just one here. Um, this is one reserve out of maybe I don't know, 50 or so in New Zealand. Um, there are 47 kilometers of fencing around this one area um, to protect 3,400 hectares, basically for native birds. Sometimes we turn uh, invasive species into economic opportunity. Deer were introduced into New Zealand in the mid-19th century from Scotland and England, and the environment proved to be so ideal that uh, they really thrived, and by the middle of the 20th century, they had become a pest. So uh, people started hunting this pest in, in exporting the meat, and this turned into a real economic opportunity. So in the 1970s, the Department of Conservation began live capturing deer and, and relocating them onto specially established farms. So we now have a deer farming industry, so a new industry was born, and now we have 1.1 uh, million farmed deer in the country. 
New Zealand, a small island nation of only four and a half million people, is the world's largest user of sodium fluoro uh, fluoroacetate, which is called 1080. This is the, the poison that gets, uh, gets dropped on predator-free islands, or, or islands to make them predator-free. The Department of Conservation uh, pioneered helicopter hunting of ungulates. The Department of Conservation also, um, through its own research program, develops um, cruelty-free traps for, for killing rats and stoats. And often they do this in partnership with, um, with private organizations. Um, this is a, a new trap that's recently developed that's quite interesting. Um, this is a trap that kills rats and stoats and, and other ungulates um, with a gas canister. So uh, the, the, the rat will actually enter, uh, climb up the tree and enter the trap here. And there's a canister here that shoots a, a pellet into the rat. And so a single trap can kill 24 rats before the canister has to be reloaded. So it greatly reduces the labor effort required to, to manage pests. And in areas where this has been trialed, it has, it has achieved the same effectiveness as poison drops. A couple of uh, interesting future directions. Uh, these are both uh, uh, projects that Landcare Research is undertaking. Um, we have a real problem with uh, possums in New Zealand. They're not native. And in fact, they come from Australia, and in Australia, they're threatened. Uh, so they're a protected species, but they were introduced into New Zealand about 100 years ago for the fur trade. And with no natural predators, they've absolutely thrived. And uh, as a result of this, um, we now call these, these predators, um, and the, uh, the amount of, uh, that we kill each year is measured in, not in the number of possums, but rather in the tons of possums that get killed each year. Uh, so Landcare Research developed a, an app that you can download and play on, it's a game you can play on your iPhone called Possum Stomp, where uh, you, you are a kiwi and uh, one of our native birds, our rare endemic native birds, and you run around uh, bashing on top of, uh, of the possums. Um, now this is to raise awareness of, of the impact of possums, particularly among young people. This has uh, spawned a new game uh, that was developed called Aura Save the Forest. And in this particular game, this is, this is really about crowdsourcing. Um, there you're supposed to try to manage the, uh, the native bird population by controlling rats and possums and stoats and other, other predators. And the way that you can do this is through poison drops or setting up traps uh, and setting up traps of different kinds by fencing reserves. And the, the basic idea is to, uh, is to see whether anybody can actually improve on the management that's already taking place. So all of the, the, uh, the, the game programming is based on scientific, uh, scientific measurement and, and uh, algorithms of spread of, of invasives. So quite interesting. Another future direction is uh, biocontrol of plants using a wide host of uh, bio-herbicidal fungi, fungi and also um, herbivorous insects. And there has been quite a lot of traction around this in New Zealand, and, and certainly there will be more, I think. All right, thank you, Pike, uh, for even I myself was uh, re-educated about a lot, of the, a lot of things about where, where I live now, so it, it's great. Um, transitioning just a little bit, I want to I wanna talk about some of the work that we've done in the, in the Pacific um, outside of New Zealand. So. Um, of course, New Zealand is quite isolated, but so are many of the Pacific Islands that, that Landcare also partners with uh, local organizations uh, and works in, similar to kind of uh, what we're doing here uh, in the Caribbean. Um, and just, just some, some studies that, that both Pike and I have conducted about uh, and others that we've looked at just to get a context of, of why that region is also affected in similar ways to, to many of the islands here in the Caribbean. Um, the African tulip tree, which I know is also present in many islands in the Caribbean, we found that um, controlling it could, could, could yield net benefits of more than $600 million over the lifetime um, uh, of, the, of the various projects, which amounts to about $12 million per year. And this is just, uh, just in one island of Fiji. Uh, the taro beetle, which um, basically the next two things are taro or dalo, are um, essentially a, 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 a 
kind of a staple crop in, in, in much of the Pacific that has high, high cultural value in, term, in, uh, in addition to nutrition. Um, we found that basically managing it again in one of the islands of Fiji can be up to $5 million per year uh, benefits. Uh, and recently there was a taro leaf blight that hit the, hit the main islands of, of Samoa. Um, and, and essentially taro is, the, is definitely this, the staple food of all Samoans. Um, it essentially decimated the export market and, and reduced um, crop production to almost, to almost nil, um, affecting about, about $8 million per year, um, which was uh, highly significant. Uh, and also, in, um, you might have heard some things from time to time about the brown tree snake. Um, there, there's something like um, 10,000 tree snakes per hectare or something like that in, in, in Guam. It's, um, yeah, there's over 2 million or something in the, in the actual island. And, and what they do is it causes tens of millions of dollars per year in damage, uh, not just from snake bites, but, but also power, out, power outages as it kind of gets into transformers and chews on wires and things like that. There's an average of something like 1.5 hours of power outages per day uh, directly caused by the, by the brown tree snake um, in Guam. The, the innovative thing that has come out of this, because it's been such an issue, is um, the, la the latest thing that, that they did in the last year is they um, essentially uh, populated dead mice with um, basically with, with, with some poison or toxic that then uh, what they did is um, parachuted the, the mice out of uh, planes and helicopters throughout the island to help distribute, essentially distribute this poison, and what happened is the snakes have come and eaten them, and and and, and be, so it's actually it's kind of one of the innovative ways just to try to try to manage the problem. Um, some of the work we've done in Fiji has also been not looking at just what is the problem, but but what is the potential source of income, or 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 what is the perception of this problem relative to you know, all the other kind of issues that we face or a government might face in terms of expenditures and, and, and focus, focusing on. So we've done this through kind of exercises where we, we, where we make respondents of households. So we did this in over uh, close to 500 households. We asked, if you're the finance minister and you have essentially this billion dollars worth of, worth of budget to redistribute, um, how would you redistribute the money for things like defense, transportation, environmental protection, invasive species control, et cetera? Um, and what we found in Fiji is actually, if you look at the light blue category in the top, uh, sort of the top left, um, that combined with the brown uh, is basically saying that they'd allocate up to 12% of the budget for uh, environmental management and invasive species protection, um, which is something along the lines of close to maybe, um, uh, maybe something like 80 plus million dollars per year. Uh, for context, um, in 2012, they spent um, less than a million dollars, uh, the Fijian government spent less than a million dollars for invasive species control. So it's showing kind of the, the perception uh, that people have or, or, or their willingness to basically want to invest, wanting uh, their governments to invest more in, a, in environmental and uh, invasive species uh, control uh, relative to actually what, what, what we've seen um, is, is, is actually being spent. So what this alludes to is that if the government does shift some of their emphasis towards that, it's not necessarily going to create um, social unrest or anything like that. Potentially, it could be beneficial to to the politicians in charge. Um, and then just just transitioning now to the work that we've been doing um, with with many of you in the audience in the Caribbean last year. Uh, in the last year, this is just a summary of of, of the studies that we've looked at um, and and then some of the preliminary findings that that people presented yesterday. Um, so just kind of going in order. So Casarina, Bahamas, we key, manage, key benefits and management, tourism, infrastructure, shore protection, biodiversity, uh, wood products. We found that basically for every dollar spent, there's the potential for $21 in returns of benefits. Uh, for the feral donkeys in the Dominican Republic, um, potentially returning $76 to one. Uh, for, so um, definitely sounds like worthwhile project and investment in terms of eradicating them from the island. Uh, and White Top, uh, we looked at uh, the impacts, as you know here, agriculture, human health, biodiversity, um, potentially six to one. Uh, could be more in other parts of the island, uh, as this was only through a pilot study. Giant African snail, uh, which we know that's, that's one thing that's made the media a lot here and is quite a big concern um, because it affects trade, agriculture, human health, infrastructure, and more. Um, at least a return of $4, $4 uh, for every dollar spent just for the current project that they've been going on. Uh, in terms of managing and towards eradication since 2008. Um, lionfish, we've brought that up a few times already this morning um, because of its impacts on fisheries, tourism, coral reef, and shore protection. 
Uh, feral goats were also looked at um, in terms of native species, species protection, potentially reintroducing um, the iguana. Uh, the varroa mite is affecting honey production and livelihoods, and then the rem red palm mite uh, looking at uh, effects in Trinidad and Tobago on ecotourism, biodiversity, recreation, coconut production. So it shows kind of the diverse range of species that were investigated on, on, on a variety of islands, and then um, now we at least have some, some concrete figures that we can go to. Um, when, when, looking, when, when actually citing what the potential benefits of managing in this region may be. Um, some other key findings that, uh, where they didn't necessarily focus completely on, on, on a full economic analysis, but Jamaica lionfish can potentially, damages can potentially read 38 million per uh, US per year. And also the Jamaican public values um, from that study, they found that it values marine biodiversity about $22.76 per person, or 9 million US dollars. And in the red palm might, uh, economical management options are being being explored and are available and uh, we found that the Trinidad public values the Nariva swamp at um, close to 15 million dollars US so again indicating that the at least you know that's almost the lower bound of the value or the willingness that 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 we should put into uh, protecting and preserving uh, that that swamp which is a Ramsar site has iconic status and kind of um, highlights kind of the need to 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 preserve these 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 iconic areas so where do we go from here? Um, we discussed a lot of this yesterday and throughout the week, uh, uh, many of these things are gonna come up. So, um, you know, Pike presented a number of innovative ideas that are coming out of New Zealand. Uh, a lot of you guys uh, in the presentations yesterday came up with basically presented innovative ideas and in discussion we came up with some innovative ways to think about marketing, awareness, education. Um, and, you know, as we showed, the, in, in all cases, uh, the, benefit, the benefits are outweighing the cost. So, you know, and this is supported now by by quantitative estimates, indicating that there's net benefits to society from managing. Um, so in, empirical studies show that their value for environmental protection management and uh, IAS control is typically greater than, than what current budgets are allocating. Um, so it seems like a no-brainer, but the key is that we're still living in a world with scarce resources. And this, you know, this is despite probably we have a strong passion for it in the general public. Um, you know, when they're aware, they seem to, to, to want to push more money in that direction. It's, it's still obviously not happening, which is why we're having, continuing to have, have conferences like this. Um, so essentially it's up to the public and private decision makers to invest in IS control options. So with that, I mean that we also need to take innovative ways to incentivize general public to take action. So it's education, awareness, marketing, but it's also up to all of us to not just kind of go forth with our projects and focus on that only, but think about even when the project's over, how can we continue to educate, market, increase awareness, and also do our own part, you know, even on a volunteer basis or whatever, to continue to educate and advocate for, for these issues. So it's not just about kind of finding the next set of donor money or finding, you know, having if the government just throws more money at the problem, it'll get solved. It's also we have to be proactive and continue to um, make people aware, educate, be more efficient with what, what we're trying to do. And then finally, I want to point out that, you know, a lot of the stuff we talked about today, you know, a, lot of the, a lot of the work in invasives tends to be more reactionary in the sense that this, like the giant African snail comes, it's here, now we have to set up a program to manage, eradicate, et cetera. But there's also the key thing that, that essentially we need to have a greater, a greater emphasis on biosecurity. We need to have that, as Arnie said, we need to have that legislation in place so that we can protect stuff at the border because more often than not, you know, we saw that, that you know, in New Zealand are spending up to $500 million per year. I mean, that's, that's a significant amount, but it's still that the impacts can be up to three or four billion. So um, it's much, much better if we can try to prevent this stuff uh, from ever coming in. And so the idea behind that is an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, and so with that, uh, I thank you very much. And this is, as you guys all probably know, this is kind of New Zealand's most iconic bird, the kiwi. So um, thank you very much. Thank you, Bob, for the opportunity to talk. <laughs>